I want to talk about the truth in the context of the truth setting us free. What I'm going to talk about is probably going to be controversial. It's probably going to be something you've never heard before. I've never heard it. I've been looking at it for years. I've hesitated bringing it forward because I'm, I'm, we, my wife and I are not here just to be outrageous or anything. We believe in what we believe in, and we want it to be effective when we share it with you. So, like I said, I've been developing this for a long time, for for several years, and I'm not going to bring the whole thing right now, but I just want to bring part of it so I can get the ball rolling, so to speak, having to do with the truth and the fact that it does set you free, and that's a wonderful thing. And I've been thinking about it a lot today because we've been listening to different lessons and about how, from the negative standpoint, about how the lie keeps you down, and I wanted to deliver or teach or bring a message that is more focused on the positive because it's truth that the lie does keep people down there's so many of them and they're all originated by the devil by the the evil one our enemy himself ours and God's they're right there in the garden that's where the source of everything comes from the beginning of everything both the good and the evil comes right there from Genesis we can see it so I want you to think about and understand that these things apply to our lives now religion and religious concepts were basically invented right there in the garden by the devil because we we see religion as evil as founded on the evil lie that our god is not who he is as a person and that he's not who he is as in the one who loves us and is our savior that's been a lie from the very beginning so i just want to jump right in here in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 God says to the man but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die and that means that day they died that's very clear we'll see that as we go on but they died I know there's all kinds of theologies and teachings that say they began to die but it was the spiritual death that was significant it wasn't a physical death that happened hundreds of years later. So we go on to chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so he's told a lie. God said they will die. He says they won't. A few verses later, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. Well, it sounds like God is agreeing with him. Look at that. He said, The man has become like one of us. The devil said, You won't die. You'll be like God. So there's something in there that's a partial truth. That the devil takes a partial truth and he twists it. He obscures the fact that they will die to their God, the spiritual death that he was talking about. And there was a truth that he would become like one of them. Not the God, not their God, like one of us. God was speaking in the presence of his angels. They at that moment became like one of them, knowing good and evil. They became like the devil. The one who introduced them to the knowledge of good and evil. Because I want you to really think about this. Can not God know good and evil like you and I know good and evil? Or to exaggerate the point, like Ted Bundy or John Wayne Gacy or Stalin or Pol Pot or some horrible person. Or just someone that, that really hurts you that you think, well, I'm not as bad as that person. You know, I believe we all know evil in an intimate way because we're human beings but if you think you don't know it like those people and I'm sure you haven't done evil things like Pol Pot or something but can God know evil like they do because that word for no I know it's a common word and it can be used casually but it's also used for the next chapter when it says and Adam knew his wife it means intimacy he knew his wife and she became a child so I'm asking you to ask yourself do you really believe God can know evil in that way I don't think he can. I really don't think he can. I know that scripture in Isaiah says, I create evil. I don't think he created evil. He created the opportunity for evil because he gave us and the angels a choice. 
And the angel made a choice. And he sent one of his messengers there in the form of that serpent. And we became like one of them. We didn't become as like, we're now we're just another. Because it couldn't mean that. Think about it. God was saying we just became like the three of them, so, so to speak. That's why I reject that. It's talking about, he's talking about him and the Holy Spirit and the Son. That's ridiculous. We didn't become like one of those, one of them. There is no them, obviously. But even if there was, it would make no sense that we became like the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father. No, that's not what it means. We became like one of them, one of the ones that we're speaking to. And that's why I say this is a huge subject. I'm not going to get into all of it, but you can investigate this. In 1 Kings 22 and 2 Chronicles 18, there's a story told where God consults or counsels with his angels to make a decision about Ahab. And there's other references to it also. God does do things after the counsel of the angels. He does. And that's all this is a reference to. We became like one of them. We became like Satan, the fallen one, by trusting in him. Because now we can become like, not we become Jesus, but we become like him in that we put our trust in him. Who you become, who you place your trust in is someone who you pattern after, you follow after. We follow Jesus not to be Jesus or to be like Jesus, but to follow the one who's good. Well, in that case, in the garden, they believed and followed the one who lied, the one who told an untruth about their God. And he invented the first, the first polytheism right there in the garden. Satan, the man, and the woman. Three of them right there. So moving on, I jump way ahead into Luke chapter 10, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus, it says, And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He said this to the 70 when they came back, and they'd already been doing these things. They've been trampling on scorpions and serpents, and they had power over the enemy because they were casting out devils. After that, he says, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So to say it another way, you say, the devil could have rule over you and crush you and destroy you, but still rejoice because your name is written in heaven. That's the important thing, because all this is temporal, and the devil is going to do what he's going to do. And sometimes, as you see in the book of Job, he did some pretty awful things. But the only thing that matters is that your name is written in the book of heaven. How, how is your name written in heaven? I think it has to do with you knowing who your God is. How can you be written? I mean, God is heaven. So how can your name be written there unless you know who he is? That's why it was there. He was talking to them who knew him, who knew who he was, who understood in some level that that was their God they were relating to, that they were communing with, that they were walking with, that they were trusting in. They had their God right there with them. So he was just trying to tell them, hey, that's great that you can do those things, but that's not what to rejoice over because he saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Satan did a lot of things, a lot of amazing things, but Satan's not blessed. Satan doesn't acknowledge who his God is. He wants to be like him. Sound familiar? If you've ever been in any church service of any kind, you've been told, you're instructed to be like Jesus. I don't know who you believe Jesus is. My wife and I believe he's our God. And we used to adhere to that, believe in that religious concept to be like Jesus. But once we saw the utter profanity of that, we rejected it and we turned from that. We repented from that. We repented from religion and turned towards our God. Not towards being like him, but trust in him. So that's why we have a different life, a new life, a life that is based on trust in our God. Moving along here further, it, excuse me, in the same passage in Luke chapter 10, I move to verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. And I just put a note there. I'll have the notes here and in the drop down. My note is he spoke to the one living within. Because he was speaking to them, now he speaks to the one living within, and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. We'll stop right there. Acts 10.36, it says, The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now, that's not a contradiction. There's not two lords. We have only one Lord and Father of all. 
who is above all, through all, and in you all. That is, in, in you who have faith. Your God is in you by faith. He just thanked the Father who is Lord of heaven and earth. In the book of Acts, he himself is identified as Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of all. That's why he, he spoke in that language. He spoke in that enigmatic language because he knew men would corrupt it. But he would rather have men corrupt the word as it is than to destroy it. That's why when people say, well, why didn't Jesus just say, I'm God? Because they would have destroyed the Bibles. They would have ruined them. Where right now, the truth is hidden in plain sight right before all of us to see. And I'm going to get to that, too. The fact that it's some can see it and some can't. And I, and I hope you all can see it. But if you can't, that's okay. Just keep seeking it. So let's start back again. Verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit that is spoke to the one living within and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it please you in your sight. So he's just, he's told them something right before that. He said, you have all power over the enemy, tread on serpents and scorpions. But don't rejoice in that. Rejoice because your Father has your name written down in heaven. That's the thing. And then he talks to the Father for a moment. And then it's, that's the end of speaking to the one who lives within. Then in verse 22, he speaks directly to his friends. And he says, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. You see that? He wasn't saying that to the Father anymore. Now he basically turns and says to them, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now, I don't know if you ever really looked at real hard at that, but think about it. How can it be that no one knows who this one is except that one, and who that one is except this one? There's the only one way that is, is if this one and that one are just one. It's just that God came here as a human being, as that man, and he was trying to get them to grasp this. And like you say, he was writing it down, had it written down in perpetuity so that all of us could look at it and see and choose to believe or not. To believe what he said or not. God was walking with Adam and Eve. They chose not to believe him. They chose not to trust him. They had, there was no better testimony. That was way better than the Bible, I think, that they had their God speaking and walking and talking right with them, right there. They still had a choice. They chose not to believe. We have a choice to look at this for what it is. He speaks to them. He speaks to his father. And then he says, no one, no one knows who the son is except the father. That's another thing you ought to think about. Why is he always speaking about himself in the third person? He speaks about himself, the son this, the son that, the son this, the son that. Well, of course, when he speaks about himself, he also says the father this, the father that, the father this, the father that. So when he comes back to saying me, he just means me, the Father, the Son, you know, God, that's me. That's the only way that someone would have personal information about someone else, quote unquote, and that other one would have personal information about them is if that person is one and the same person. And then he goes on to say, to whom the Son will reveal, wills to reveal him. So Jesus revealed who the Father is by showing them himself. By showing them himself. That's why I could say to Thomas, have I been so long time with you, uh, or Philip, that you, you have not known me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he's saying. I revealed the Father. Not, not merely a reflection or telling you about him. I'm showing you him because I am him. And the two verses I have to, to indicate that or drive that home is John 6, 44. He says, no man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's interchangeable. It's the same thing. To come to Jesus is to come to the Father. To come to the Father is to come to, to Jesus. He's just saying it, like I say, in that enigmatic way. He spoke to us in Proverbs when he was here on the earth because he saw what happened. Because he had to outsmart the devil. He spoke plainly in the Old Testament before the fall. He just said, hey, when you eat that, you're going to die. He didn't, that wasn't a proverb. That wasn't a parable. That wasn't a what if kind of sort of in a way. That was just direct speech. But because the devil is so clever himself, God starts speaking in this more parabolic or, 
or pro proverb, proverbial speech, because he has to outsmart the devil and allow for us to make a choice. Am I going to believe my God or am I going to believe the one lying to me about my God? The one that, yes, I was born into this world more like him, the God of this world, than I was like my father. But now that I put my trust in my father, I can see these words. And it doesn't matter that tens of thousands or millions of people and denominations and, and religions and leaders and so-called smart and wise people say it. Contrary to what my God says, I can put my trust in what my God says because my God says it. And it's all right there. All you have to do is look at it. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. What else do you need to know? He reveals himself to whom he will. Who will he reveal himself to? Those who want to know who he is. Not want to know their religion, confirmation of their denomination, of their statement of faith, or whatever it is that they're supposed to believe because a bunch of wise people told them. No, because you're willing to stand alone and say, no, that's my God, and I believe him and what he says, regardless of what anyone else says. I don't care if anyone backs me up, because frankly, no one backs me up. <laughs> that one scripture well, I was talking about earlier that is might be controversial, or you're going to not want to believe it, and you're not going to find anyone that will believe it. When he said, behold, the man has become as one of us, the one of us was Satan. That's what we became like. That's what the man and the woman became of. It wasn't we became like God. God wasn't lying. Satan wasn't telling the truth. Because to believe that we became like one of the three of the Trinity is, I don't know why I would have to explain why that doesn't make any sense. But that's insanity. We did not become like God. We became like one that was with God. And now you can become with your God, not like your God, become with him, come into his presence by simply putting your faith in who he is. And he'll give you power or he won't give you power. But be glad and rejoice that your name is written in heaven through faith in who he is, through faith in the only one true God, that one that gives you his life, his spirit. It's only one spirit. If the Holy Spirit is not the Father, is not the Son, then there's three spirits. What spirit has he given you? Think about this. we got to really think about this and believe in our one God. In Jesus' name, amen.